But the third transcendental beauty is something that doesn't need explaining. Welcome to Catholic Conversations. I'm here with Max Molinex, and we're going to be talking about music today. What's good to play during Mass? What's good to play during adoration? What is the purpose of music in the church? What is going on with all all this uh, complicated things that have to do with music? Uh, We're going to approach some of these questions today and over the next few weeks, and um, we hope you're interested. And if you have any questions, email us. I'll give you the handle to email us at the end. And uh, we will get right back in. So I'm Adrian Fonseca with Catholic Conversations with my co-host, uh, Max Molinax. Hello. All right, Max. So what are we talking about today? Well, um, first, I'd like to ask how you're doing. Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Good. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keeping busy, you know. How are finals coming? Uh, Starting? Yeah. I uh, just got my first final already. So. Oh, joy. Yay. Take home. So it's going to be a lot of papers, for a lot father, of pages. For um for Father Dempsey, yeah, 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 great, wow, yeah, his take-home finals are hard. Yeah, they're so pretty long. Luck. They're good, very long. Good luck. Um, I'm talking rather quiet because we are in a confined space. Yeah, our, our normal room has been infiltrated by, um, someone. I don't know who. <laughs> some guy in a group study room, and he's just one guy. You sound really salty. I am saltier than the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Or this the specific ocean, like the very speci- specific. The the uh, yeah, I'm very Pacific. Yeah, all right. You're so Pacific in your grammar, in your your language. Yeah. So today we are. Uh, I wanted to talk about sacred music. That's a broad topic, but what I want to do in, in in a couple of episodes is to kind of give people an idea of of the past church documents, especially from the past hundred years pertaining to sacred music. Because so often today, especially in traditional circles, people say, well, I don't like music from the gather hymnal because it's bad, because it sucks. No good. Can't do it. (laughs) And while they're, you know, you're right, is bad and it does suck. We need to be able to have... Why does it? Exactly. We need to be able to tell people why. Because if we always appeal to I like or I feel then we're doing the exact same thing that the modernists want us to do. Exactly. And also, so, okay, so I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What on earth makes you qualify to talk about this? Because I have a bachelor's degree in music and I'm uh, in the middle of a master's degree in sacred music, but I'll be entering, uh, entering the, the, the priesthood here in August. Um, so that, that will be the end of that, but it won't be the end of my music, my, my exploits in music. I'll be, singing the divine office with my community, singing the mass. And there's a possibility, although it's not the goal for me of continued education at some point during my formation in music. But that's only if the community wants for me to, I don't really care one way or another, whatever God wants. Um, okay. So that's your qualification. That's that my qualification. Sounds, sounds pretty good. Anyway, it's pretty good qualification. Yeah. So the, we want to be able to say more than just, well, I like, or I feel, or I don't like, or I don't feel. Uh, what I want to do is kind of give give us the tools to do that, to be able to do that. Time travel with me back to the year 1903. That sounds like a long time ago. That was a very long time ago. Yeah, it sounds like about 100 years. 106 years. Wow. Yep, a long time ago. Who was Pope at that time? Do you know? Uh, was it Pius X? It was. Dang. St. Pius X. That's dope. Uh, his last name was Sarto. Really? Yeah. I that sounds his... like, that sounds like a, a villain. <laughs> it does. It sounds it? like something from Lord of the Rings. Taylor Marshall said that Sarto in Latin, in Italian means tailor. Really? Like a, like a tailor making I, clothes. That's funny. Um, the, it's okay. As soon as you said Sarto, I immediately thought of a Lord of the Rings and I'm like, Oh, so Pius Tenth was like looming over everyone. Like about to destroy. <laughs> no, this, you haven't even read Lord of the Rings. No, I haven't. I've seen the movies though. That is depressing as heck. <laughs> The books are much better and you can understand the movies way better when you read the books. Anyway, but I like the movies. They're really good. So 1903, Pius X has just been elected Pope. It was apparently an unexpected election and he's sort of thrust into the role. But the very first thing he does or right sort of towards the front of his papacy is release a document called Tra le solicitudini. Wow, that is a mouthful. It is a mouthful. I don't even know if I can say that. All it means is among the concerns, among I, the I cares. Can, I can say that. So if you look at the first letter, first line of it, it's among the cares of the pastoral office. That's all it is. And it, yeah, it doesn't really give any hint, any indication as to what it's actually about. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm like, now I'm in all my, uh, the ends of my chair. 
Yeah. Where does the music part come? But what he, what this is about is it's a, it's an instruction, a motu proprio. What's a motu proprio? A motu, motu proprio is a, an act of legislation that the Pope releases on his, of his own accord without uh, consultation from anyone else. The, so, it's like a, so it's like a um, an order by the Pope. It's like an executive order in oh, okay. American law, I think. Uh, so Samorum Pontificum was the document that allowed for the, that clarified that the Latin Mass was never abrogated and that Benedict XVI used in order to allow us to celebrate it so that no priest needed permission from a bishop. So um, Pius X releases this um, in his... So what, what what he's what he was um, experiencing as a bishop, and even before then. So he, from a boy, from a uh, young young age, had always loved Gregorian chant. He knew the prayerful qualities of it, which we'll talk about here in a minute. He was always singing in choirs, and I I believe that whenever he was a pastor, uh, parishes, music was a big concern of his music and liturgy. So when he became a bishop, I cannot remember which diocese, but whenever he became a bishop, there had cropped up the problem of setting the texts of the mass to music that was either directly ripped from popular Italian operas of the day or composed in the same operatic style. So would that be like if I like decided I really like this song from uh, this new musical and decided to put it into the mass? Would that, would that yeah, be like, basically. It's, okay. It's the same thing. Or what, it, what if it was, what about um, if I went and got a mu- music from a concert or something? Would that be the same thing? Exactly. Okay. So like opera was kind of like a concert of the time. Opera was the popular music oh, okay. of the time. Wow. I would never expect that because I in Italy. don't listen to opera at all. <laughs> no, especially in Italy, it was really popular. So it would have been like Queen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> was opera only interested, were the rich only interested in opera or was that like everyone was interested in opera? Depends on what time period you're talking about and what country you're talking about. Let's say Pius X time. Uh, from what I can tell, it was pretty widely enjoyed. So not just the rich. Okay. That's why That's why this was happening. That's why in, even in uh, just regular churches, people were taking popular opera melodies. Okay. Okay. And that gives good context because I was, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah. I yeah. Don't know. Okay. No, it's, it's, there are a lot of poor people and middle class people who love opera. So Alrighty. It, that's sort of a stereotype that doesn't, isn't really true. Okay. That only the rich enjoy it. Um, but uh, so that was the problem he was dealing with. And he realized that was a problem right away. So he releases Trales of Lecitudini when he uh, becomes Pope, About I, I think about a month afterwards. And uh, what it does is it kind of sets precedent for the next hundred years. So that's the track I want to follow is I want to look at Trales of Lecitudini. Then in a separate episode, I want to finish looking at it because I don't think I'll finish it today. Then we want to look at a little bit of Pius the Twelfth and his what he takes from it, then leading up to Vatican II, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which doesn't write itself in, it isn't written in a vacuum. It has everything that Sacrosanctum Concilium says is the culmination of the previous, uh, you know, 60, 70 years. Then finally finish with currently the top legislation on sacred music, which is Musicum Sacrum, released in 1967. What's Musicum Sacrum? Musicum Sacrum. Musicum? Mm-hmm. What is it? It's an instruction on sacred music. Is that like a um, dogmatic it, constitution from Vatican II or is no, it? No, it's post-Vatican II. Oh, post-Vatican II. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's, this is what you should be doing in church. Okay. This is how the music, there's actually a, an order, a structure of things to be sung mm-hmm. that it gives. So if you don't sing X, Y, or Z, then you can't sing for hymns. Oh, okay. If you don't, the first thing it says to be sung is... Uh, uh, anyway, we'll talk about that later. All right. All right. I don't want to spoil it. All right. It's pretty interesting because nobody follows it, literally. Even the most traditional places don't follow it. So let's dig in. Charles Alecci Tudini. So we're going to skip that sort of beginning part. That's the, the letter. Good, because I would read through that and I was like, yeah, that's just it's words. It's very important. Words. Though. No, it's very important because this is where we get the term active participation from. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. It mm-hmm. kept on using the word active participation. Mm-hmm. And I was always taught that active participation meant that I needed to sing during mass and I needed to stand and hold my hands and pick my hands up at the right times and participate in bringing up the gifts. So what the heck is active participation? So active participation, um, does not. So the Latin is participatio actuosa. Uh, and Sacrosanctum Concilium actually says this as well, that participation is first internal. 
So it doesn't, it doesn't by necessity mean something external, like waving your hands around or even singing. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Okay. But it can, but it, but I'll get to that. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean that what it means is that Pius X wants to emphasize that the rights need to be known by the people so that they can be engaged first internally with what's going on. He says, filled as we are with a most ardent desire to see the true Christian spirit flourish in every respect and be preserved by all the faithful. We deem it necessary to provide before anything else for, uh, for the sanctity and dignity of the temple in which the faithful assemble for no other object than that of acquiring this spirit from its foremost and indispensable font, which is the active participation in the most holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. So the participation is first internal. Okay. And what, and it, but it can, and it, I would argue it does mean that you do things as an external sign of that internal participation. Okay. So then, um, then the question that automatically comes to my mind is if, the whole point of active participation is for the understanding of the congregation, then why would we use Latin text? I mean, you, you can use a hand missile. Uh, but what I don't, but so my problem is a lot of people will be like, yeah, I mean, it sounds nice, but I have no idea what the words mean. Learn what they mean <laughs> outside of mass. I mean, the, the idea of Latin is another, um, the, the point is not the words that you're saying. But the but the intention behind so that you at least know ocest anim corpus uh, whatever it is corpus is um, this is my body. I mean you don't need you don't that doesn't need to be in English for you to know what that guy's saying because he says every time right right and you the, know if you learn the prayers once if you learn the ordinary of the mass once you'll know it again and again and again and you internalize it and you pray about it and you you. Um, make it part of your prayer throughout the mass, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for those parts of the mass, but what about songs that are that something that you don't hear every single Sunday? Well, there's nothing wrong with singing stuff in the vernacular. Okay. Well, it depends on what form of the mass we're talking about, extraordinary or the ordinary, but even in the extraordinary form, you can sing vernacular hymns, but you can't sing the propers in vernacular. You can't sing the ordinary in vernacular. Okay. Well, I assume we're going to get to something like that later. Yeah. 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 All this right, is all, all right. anyway, active participation. That's not really, um, we'll talk about that later with Sacrosanctum Concilium, but it's internal first. And that's what Pius X is trying to emphasize. So like uniting our prayers. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't mean everybody has a job to do during mass. It doesn't mean that, um, you have to, that everybody has to be to, uh, so I don't have to become an extraordinary minister of Holy do, communion. No. Oh, okay. No way. Um, All right. That don't makes have sense. to pump the Purell. All right. Awesome. Um, you don't have to bear gifts. You don't have to be a hospitality minister. Yeah, that's right. You know, you don't have to bring up the gifts in your traditional Mexican garb. Yep. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, with my cowboy boots. Exactly. No, it means internal participation, which is what, the liturgical movement of the of the nineteenth century was trying to do is to get people to understand what is going on in the mass. To quote a priest I know, the litur liturgical movement was not about moving furniture, but it was about moving hearts. So it wasn't about moving things in the mass to change the mass, but it was about moving people, changing people's disposition towards the mass by teaching them about it. So anyway, um, Pius the tenth in if you move to section one, general principles, this is really the most important part of this thing. Okay. Sacred music being a complementary part of the liturgy participates in the general scope of the liturgy, which is the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faithful. Okay. So first, Adrian, if I asked you, what is liturgy? What would you say? Um, I don't know. I may be uh, an official prayer by the church directed towards God for proper worship? Um, that's a good answer, yeah. Litur there's a couple of answers. Liturgy is, so it comes from a Greek word, liturgos, right? And the liturgos is, it, which means works work on behalf of the people. Um, 
Oh, so it's not work of the people. It's work on behalf oh. of the people. See, I always heard that it was work of the people. Nope. So it's work for the people. Yep. Okay. Um, so it's also the public prayer of the church, as you said. So the liturgy includes not just the mass, that's the most visible form of it, but it also includes all the sacraments and the divine office. So that's what the liturgy is, public prayer of the church, um, work on behalf of the people. So sacred music, therefore, being a complementary part of this solemn liturgy, participates in the general scope of the liturgy. Now the scope of the liturgy, he says, is the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faithful. That's the purpose of the liturgy. Glory of God, sanctification, and edification of the people. Do you know what that means? No, not at all. How does the liturgy sanctify? So I would assume that they're referring to the Eucharist sanctifies and glorifies. Mm -hmm. Um, But what about everything else in the liturgy? I mean, because it doesn't say the Eucharist sanctifies, it says the liturgy does. And I'm assuming it doesn't refer to only the Eucharist. So what about the the Eucharist? Is just I mean, it's a sacrament. That takes place within the context of the mass. Right. So how does the liturgy itself sanctify and glorify? They sanctify by imparting grace to us, which is the the divine life of God. Um, but what you're talking about, I think, is how does the extra sacramental stuff, the non-sacramental stuff. Right, right. Yeah. So, well, think about it. Um, divine office. You're praying the Psalms. Need I say more? <laughs> yes, you do need to say more. No, it's a prayer. You are... You're praying in a in the most perfect way using the text of the Holy Scripture, it, it, so that God might reflect some of that, some of your worship back onto you, right? Because He doesn't require us to worship Him, but it's good for us to. We owe it to Him. So you mean He doesn't need us to worship because He does require right. us? Well, yeah, to. yeah, but I mean He's not going to die if we don't worship Him, right? The purpose of the liturgy is the glory of God, the worship of God. Okay, number one. And the sanctification and edification of the people. Sanctification being making holy, edification being uh, building up of the faithful. Okay. Building up uh, physically, spiritually? Spiritually. Spiritually. So building them up spiritually. Yep. It contributes to the decorum and the splendor of the ecclesiastical ceremonies. And since its principal office is to clothe with suitable melody the liturgical text proposed for the understanding of the faithful... Its proper aim is to add greater efficacy to the text in order that through it the faithful may be more easily moved to devotion and better disposed for the reception of the fruits of grace belonging to the celebration of the mysteries. So what did you just say? (laughs) I said, sacred music makes the liturgy more beautiful since its principal job, its primary job is to, as he says, clothe with suitable melody the liturgical text proposed for the understanding of the faithful to set to music in a proper way the text of the mass that the pe- that the church has proposed okay so it's like getting the text and dressing it up really nicely yeah for, for the purpose it's elevating the text okay. for the purpose of adding greater efficacy so helping people both understand it more and internalize it more exactly okay adding greater efficacy or power so since its purpose is to clothe with suitable melody the text proposed for the understanding of the faithful Its proper aim is to add greater efficacy to the text, power to the text, in order that through it the faithful may be more easily moved to devotion and better disposed for the reception of the fruits of grace belonging to the celebration of the most holy mysteries. So everything is directing towards our reception of the Eucharist. Yes. I mean, not necessarily the reception, but that plus the celebration, because you can celebrate it without receiving it. Yeah, but you're not wrong. Okay, but it's not limited to that. Okay, not limited to the Eucharist. So, in order that the faithful may be more easily moved to devotion, I mean, do we know what these things mean without really having to explain them? So that the faithful may be more easily moved to devotion and better disposed for the reception of the fruits of grace. But we understand what that means without explaining it a lot. Okay, right? Sure. Yeah. It you know it when it happens to you, right? Like when you're sitting in mass and you're like, oh. Wow, I, I feel inspired. It. Exactly. You know when it happened. Sacred music, okay, so number two. Sacred music should consequently possess, because of all those things we've just talked about, it should have, in the highest degree possible, the qualities proper to the liturgy, which are sanctification and edification of the people and the glory of God, and in particularly, sorry, and in particular, sanctity and goodness of form which will spontaneously produce the final quality of universality. 
So this is the backbone of, of um, what he's going to, what he's going to talk about of the rest of this document is universality. No, these three qualities. Oh, okay. Well, what does he mean by universality? I'm getting to that. Okay. He says, so the sacred music should have sanctity. So these are three qualities of sacred music that we need to remember. Okay. Write these down. It should have sanctity. It should have goodness of form or beauty is another way of saying that, meaning all the parts work in harmony. And then if you have those two things, it will naturally produce universality. And we'll talk about what everything means right here. It must be holy and must therefore exclude all profanity, not only in itself, but the manner in which, but in the manner in which it is presented by those who execute it. Okay, so there's, what he says is, um, for sanctity, that therefore it must exclude profanity. That doesn't just mean cussing. Okay. Yeah, so the profane is referring to what specifically? Profane comes from two Latin words, pro and fanus, meaning before or outside, and fanus is a, a temple, before the temple. So anything that's not uh, worthy to be inside the temple would anything be profane. Anything that is not of its nature part of the temple, uh, inside the temple, right? Mm, okay. Anything you'd find outside, that's profane. It's not necessarily bad. Right. So if I like bring in, I don't know, a what? I mean, if you... So if I would start well, dancing... Okay, so, so like um, cheeseburger. Cheeseburgers okay, so if are you good. Say, so if I bring food into the church... Yeah, they don't belong in church. Right. You know? Okay, so you, we automatically have a revulsion to bring in food into a church. Why is that? Because it's the profane. It's not it does, it's bad not a place in for itself. Eating. It's just... There's a time and place for everything. To, okay. There's a time and place for everything. Just like flip-flops and swim shorts. So that which doesn't belong. Exactly. So it must... Be, therefore... Exclude it must pr- exclude all profanity, not only in itself, meaning not only in the text. So not only should the text be not secular, which did happen a lot actually in church history. Um, so you shouldn't be singing "Let It Be" in church or "Hallelujah" by Jeff by Leonard Cohen. That is not a sick uh, spiritual song. I can't sing "Stairway to Heaven." <laughs> yeah, that's wrong heaven. Okay, no, okay, that's the wrong heaven. All right, all right. Um, so not only in the text, but also in the manner in which it is presented by those who execute it, meaning the style in which it's performed. Okay. Right, right. So th- I had a question about that mm-hmm. because I was reading through the document and it was talking about what instruments can be used and which can't. And I was shocked whenever he said the piano is a huge no-go. And I was like, what? The piano? What, what What's going on here? Again, it's this idea of nothing profane. Nothing that you would find outside the temple that is common in usage outside the temple. Okay. So in our modern day, I just got to say it, life teen. So it's no, no guitars, no guitars, no bass drums no or bass any kind drum. of drums. Um, what about an accordion? Accordions aren't well, used that okay, often. Okay. Well, let's talk about style first. Not, let's not talk about instruments yet. Let's talk about, even if I'm singing a cappella, no instruments. Okay. Um, I can't sing like a pop singer. Gloria in excelsis Deo. So right? that's a no? That is a big no. Oh, okay. All right. Because what is it? When I sing like that, you think of what? Like Justin Bieber or, who, or something like that. Right. Whoever's right. popular today. Mm. I say, so whenever they're like the, so one time I always hear the Gloria, Gloria in excelsis. What about that? Oh, I don't know that one. Oh, you don't know that one. Sounds okay. Aw- sounds but awful. They, they, they would do that often at one of the churches they used to go to. And I was always like, Oh, that sounds cool. Or I found, I heard about uh, something called the, my little pony, Gloria. What? <laughs> glory to God. Glory to God. In the home. <laughs> I don't know exactly how it goes. But no way. Yeah. Wow. Yes, yes way. Okay. Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> And Jesus was like, they were like, no way. And he was like, Yahweh. Okay. Okay. Back okay. on track. Um, um, okay. So, 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 all no the, so the standard, yeah, the, the style in which it is presented. Okay. Can you give an example of what would be fitting? Yes. Something that is, doesn't sound like a pop singer or a country singer or a metal singer. Gloria in excelsis Deo. It's straight. It's unadulterated. It's not affected. 
doesn't sound like I'm using auto tune. Well, it's not distracting. It, it may be auto tuned when people are listening to this. Maybe I may have to auto tune it. Wow. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. Like you would know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, so profane out pop songs out country songs out. It has to be style. what style. We're still talking what, about what style. is a style. I know that's what okay. I'm saying. What, what style is appropriate? Anything that is not in the world. So the on the in the document they only give two examples: Gregorian so chant we're gonna, and we're, polyphony. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. That's basically it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. And organ too, to an extent. Um, but we'll get to that. Secondly, I don't want to get off track because these three qualities: sanctity. We talked about that. Then it must have goodness of form, which is the second part. So it has to look nice. Um, not so not that kind of form. So it's, he says it must be true art for otherwise it will be impossible for it to exercise on the minds of those who listen to it. That efficacy, which the church aims at obtaining and admitting into her liturgy, the art of musical sounds. So he said true art. Yeah. What the heck is true art? Is it there? He's saying false art? art is not your feelings on paper. So what is art then? Art is supposed to be a reflection of the divine. It's supposed to be our attempt at reflecting what it must be like in heaven. So what if someone says, hey, I mean, I feel like I'm being lifted to heaven when I hear these um, tones, these pop tones. Well, it's the wrong kind of heaven. <laughs> so then what, what What do you mean by what does something have to be in order to be true art? So it has to be, so we say goodness of form or beauty. Um, and I'm thinking here of St. Thomas Aquinas, three constitutive elements of beauty, consonantia, claritas, and integritas. So consonantia means the thing is that all the things work together for a purpose, for an end. All the parts fit together. Integritas, the thing is one. You don't have, I mean, consonantia and integritas are kind of related. And then finally, Claritas is radiance, which is kind of hard to explain, but you know it when you see it. Like the way that they talk, that that visionaries see, talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary when they see her, right? That mm-hmm. she was the most beautiful woman they ever saw. And it's a kind of a glow, okay? And we don't obviously see that in, say, in music, but you can hear it, especially like, a, for example, in, a, very, in, a, in a, um, a chord that is just perfectly in tune. It pops. Okay. It must be true art for otherwise it will be impossible for it to. Oh, so I'll give you an example of what's not true art. Everybody go look up Arnold Schoenberg, his piano concerto. Schoenberg created a kind of music that was called atonal music. Oh, that's wonderful music. Yeah. Not really. Meaning, have you heard some of it? Yes, I have. Meaning they they decided that they would do away with key signature, with, with any sort of tonal center at all. It just sounds... Like nothing. It just like sounds like banging on keyboards. It is depressing. I wonder if I played a little bit of it, would it go through? If you played it right now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, that's enough. That's enough. You get it? I get it. I get it. So what was wrong with that? Please explain to me. Because I just know in, intuitively that sounded really, that hurt my ears. Schoenberg was... Amongst the original, well, I don't know about the original, but he was one of the first, one of the most important uh, artists, liberal artists of the 20th century that just hated everything that everything that was structured, everything that that had order. Um, so what he did was he attacked it, and he destroyed anything that was that was had even a hint of order in it. And people went to go listen to this. Um, not really. Oh, okay. That makes sense. It was just kind of a academic exercise. Oh, okay. It was really popular. He was not the only one. Interesting. We also see this in architecture with uh, Bauhaus. Go listen to Patrick Coffin with E. Michael Jones. They talk about this. All right. I'll, keep, I'll include that in the show notes. Finally, he says, so he says that uh, it will be, so it, it, unless it's true art, it will be impossible for it to exercise on the minds of those who listen to it that efficacy which the church aims at obtaining and admitting into her liturgy, the art of musical sounds. Okay, so the point is, uh, the point of even the church letting us have music is because it makes the Mass more beautiful and it helps us to pray. 
Okay. That's the whole point. Finally, it must at the same time be universal in the sense that while every nation is permitted to admit into its ecclesiastical compositions those special forms which may be said to constitute its native music, still, these forms must be subordinated in, in such a manner to the general characteristics of sacred music that nobody of any nation may receive an impression other than good on hearing them. Okay? So if you have these first two qualities, then you will get universality. And what he means by universality, I know you're going to ask, is that, as he says, um, so that so they must conform to the manner, to the general characteristics of sacred music, so that nobody of any nation may receive an impression other than good upon hearing them. So that everybody, regardless of where you're from, knows that Gregorian chant is something holy, something good, something to be venerated, regardless of if you know anything about it. Okay. So the you said um, that there is a, an appropriate situation for bringing in other music from other cultures. Does that mean I can bring in a mariachi band and play in church? Does that conform to the characteristics of sacred music? Uh, I don't know. Does it? Is it holy? Meaning, does it exclude things that are profane that you won't find in the world? I guess not. You will find in the world. Exactly. Okay. Bam, right there. Just it, it fills the first test. All right. What about the second test? Well, it already failed the first one, so you can't go on. <laughs> let's, let's apply the second test. Okay. Well, like Schoenberg, he, would, he, he wrote some atonal vocal music that uh, in style, in manner, in text even, I don't know if it is true, but it could have been true, that even the text could have been fine for church. But the fact that it was it didn't have a tonal center excluded it from possibility, so that it fills the second test because it's not true art. Okay. Okay. So if you have these two, if you have these two qualities, then you will get universality. Okay. Now there are you can see ways in which uh, composers have brought their own sort of native styles into into music that is worthy of of the sacred space. Uh, we see this with English polyphony in the 16th, 17, uh, 16th and, and 15th centuries. It's different from continental European polyphony at the time. Yeah. What makes polyphony appropriate, but not other kinds of music like opera? Um, polyphony is, well, we'll see what Pius X has to say about that. But first he says that he talks about the different kinds of sacred music, okay? Which um, he says... These qualities are to be found in the highest degree in Gregorian chant, which is consequently the chant proper to the Roman church. So everything we just talked about, he said, is found in Gregorian chant. That is why it is the music of the liturgy, um, which is consequently the chant proper to the Roman church, the only chant she has inherited from ancient fathers, which she has jealously guarded for centuries in her liturgical codices, which she directly proposes to the faithful as her own, which she prescribes exclusively for some parts of the liturgy in which the most recent studies have so happily restored to their integrity and purity. So basically, if you want to do all this that we just talked about, just sing chant and you'll be fine. What if I don't know how to sing chant? You should learn. How? Well, the church needs to teach you. <laughs> and see, that's where the other part comes in is, is uh, thankfully we have the internet today. You know, there's lots of resources. See, not everyone is as lucky as some people are and have a professional choir singing at their church. And what if it's just a ragtag team of uh, parishioners who want to sing beautiful music at church? How do we do that? Well, like I said, in today's world, there's a lot of resources in the Internet. There's uh, Corpus Christi Watershed is a great website with a bunch of resources. There's um, some apps like Square Note that you can it has a lot of chance on there for both extraordinary and, and ordinary forms. And it will even play the chant for you if you click on it. Um, so you have to start small. There's also another book called the parish book of chant, which is great because it has, um, it has some, uh, really doable things for parishes and mass ordinaries, chant hymns, um, not propers. Um, so there's a lot of resources. Before we go, before we stop, 
I want to talk about the Gather Hymnal. Yay. This thing has been burning a hole in my truck for the last week week or so. So we're going to talk about the Gather Hymnal, which I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with. And again, the music, not everything in here is bad, but like a lot of it is. Yeah, I think there's an Ave Maria in there somewhere. Yeah. I think it says Jesus in here somewhere. Maybe. <laughs> um being sarcastic we're gonna we're gonna see if this passes muster gather us in. In. here we are i'm gonna sing a little bit of it just to refresh you here in this place new light is streaming now is the darkness vanished away see in this space our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day good that was awesome here's verse four And I'm going to show why, why this thing fails, uh, quality number one, why it is not holy. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. But here in this place, the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. So, did you catch that at the very first part? Yeah, they said that heaven was light years away. Not, not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Yeah, what's Are up with that? Are you kidding me? What does that even mean? That's heresy. What did, I, I, I actually don't even know what that means. Light, not in a heaven light years away. Does anyone believe that heaven is like in a physical place that you can travel to? But I mean, yeah, it's like... So you're saying that, I mean, this is just, it's wrong on so many levels. It's like, we should not be looking to heaven because the next part of it says, but here in this place, the new light is, so not in heaven, but here, Whoa. the new light is streaming. Here on earth, the new light is streaming. Whoa. Now is the kingdom, capital K. Now is the day. My goodness. Whoa. It's so, so much. So there's no, it's, no, not looking forward to the eschaton, but looking toward today. Right. It's materialistic. That's crazy. That's crazy. Who wrote it? Oh, guess what? Well, who? He's not even a Catholic. Of course, who is he, it? Of course, Dan shoots a Catholic. <laughs> uh, you know, that doesn't mean, uh, Marty Hagen is a Lutheran. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're getting Lutherans to write our songs. What? We're getting Lutherans to write our songs. Yep. Wow. Because Palestrina wasn't good enough. So, okay. Let's go through the test. Okay, so it fails level number one because of that text right there. Not in some heaven light years away. Okay, let's assume that the text was right, though. Okay, it also fails number one because it sounds like the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I have no idea what that means. Go listen to it. It's it's um, Basically, this song sounds like Simon and Garfunkel, 70s (laughs) folk music. I mean, it sounds like folk music because it is folk music with semi-religious words. Okay, so That's the then, so therefore, it's profane. It's profane it, because you would you would find this on the radio if you were living in 1972. Okay, um, so what about so it, since it's no longer a popular music style, could it be considered um, good today? No, because people still listen to it. Okay, so it'd have to be something that was ancient. Even if it was popular and not and is not popular anymore, that it still wouldn't pass muster. But that's kind of a different question. Okay. Well, let's let's go to the second test then. Second test. I mean, it already failed the first one, so we don't even need to look at it anymore. But um, it must be true art, meaning it must be a good. It must be good musically. Is this good musically? No, because it's weird. Because he starts you out in um, the key of he starts you out in D major, which is two sharps. And yet you don't actually have a C sharp throughout the whole piece. You have C natural every time, which doesn't make any sense. Why would it's this stupid? Uh, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> okay, sorry, I got. <laughs> um, if you notice in a lot of music from this era, they'll go to what we call the subtonic. Do do, like you can hear it at the end of uh, the piece. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bone. It's so common that 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 hard. It'd be easier if I had a piano, but that is so common and it's so terrible. It's so corny. So it's like getting a song, um, like a jingle. Yes. It's okay. So corny. 
So because it's super uh, generic, therefore it, it fails the second test. Yeah, yeah. So it, it must be true art, for otherwise it would be impossible for it to exercise on the minds of, the, of those who listen to it that efficacy, which the church aims at. A, okay, so I would argue that this that it it doesn't fail the second test as clearly as it fails the first one. Okay. This is kind of where we just have to say, well, we know this is bad because we just do. You hear the song and you just know it's bad. <laughs> um, and therefore it fails the third test because you have to have the first two qualities. Okay. So the third, third test is universalis. Yeah. Universality. Universality. And it's not really a test because you have to have the first two in order for it to even be present. Right. Okay. And I could just go through this thing and find all kinds of, Let's flip it open to a different one and just try the same thing. See what see what happens. <laughs> Christ is the world in which we move. Christ, dear Christ, are the folk we're summoned to love. Christ is the voice which calls us to care. And Christ is the one who meets us here. All right, it says, To the lost feel for the people we have most avoid, strange or bereaved or never employed. Feel for the women and feel for the men who fear that their living is all in vain. Feel for the parents who lost their child. Feel for the women who men have defiled. Feel for the baby for whom there's no breast, and feel for the weary who find no rest. Feel for the lives by life confused, riddled with doubt, a loving in loving abused. I notice there's a lack of scripture in this. Yeah, it's very unscriptural. But, you know, what it's saying is we should be kind to people who are downtrodden. And yeah, Jesus, Jesus says that we need to do that. But I would say that this thing, this thing is part of a dangerous trend in... A lot of music from the Gather Hymnal, which is um, that it focuses on here, mm-hmm. earth. It focuses on social justice. It ignores the eschaton. It ignores heaven. It ignores so, heaven. Yeah. So then um, the so what immediately pops to mind is lex orendi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. Exactly. So the if we pray referring to the world always, we're going to start believing in the world and not anything after the world. Yeah. And if we pray always, all the music that we sing in mass and everything like that refers to these social justice things. We forget about the spiritual works of mercy. Exactly. Which Gregorian chant, we keep coming back to it, but it's words are scripture. Okay. So I want to. So we talked about terrible music. What about good music? So I think it'd be beneficial to look at what a proper use of text in Gregorian chant um, how that actually benefits the church and benefits us as people and what the actual music is that helps us. Okay, well, today was uh, in the old calendar, in the traditional calendar, Feast of the Finding of the Holy Cross. Okay. Um, that's And we, we did a, uh, a high mass today. The intro is Nos Autem Gloriari, uh, from, which comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. He says, God forbid that I should make a display of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world stands crucified to me and I in the world, and I to the world. Um, I've also heard it said, we should not glory in anything but the cross of Christ. Y- you can just hear that and know that's better than gather, gather us in. <laughs> right? Because it comes from Holy Scripture. Right. And Scripture is always objectively better. Exactly. The offertory. Dextera Domini, which is uh, from Psalm 117. There's only a few times where chant is not from Scripture. And you'll find that here in the Alleluia of this Mass, Dulce Lignum, which is uh, sweet wood. It's talking about the sweet wood of the cross, right? So it's still talking about scriptural things. Or Ad Te Levavi, the introit for Advent 1, Psalm 31. Um, all over the place you'll find sacred scripture in Gregorian chant. Okay, and that's why it's good. And that's that's why the church espouses it, because it, it 
Gregorian chant is the most suitable method. The most suitable means by which the, the text of the liturgy is elevated and supported in a manner in which the faithful can receive it and thereby receive the graces of the liturgy and be further disposed towards uh, devotion and receiving the graces of the holy mysteries. Um, Gregorian chant elevates the text and reflects the text. So that's why it's good. Uh, Sacred polyphony, which is kind of like, in, in a way to describe it uh, quickly, is many, many, many lines of Gregorian chant going at the same time with the same text. Um, it's good because it it reflects the same tendencies of Gregorian chant to to elevate the text in a uh, speech like manner. So, in the same way that we would speak it, in, in the same speech patterns that we would that we would use to speak it, we also sing it. And, the, and chant does that naturally with proper mm-hmm. cadence, emphasis, and cadence. And so, does the the cadence mm-hmm. have anything to do with the text? Yeah, it does. Like in the introit today, so it's at the end. Perquem salvati et liberati sumus. Listen to how it sets that, especially the end of sumus. Perquem salvati. Et liberati sumus. So you say sumus. The stress is on the first syllable. In the music, it has su. It has an epizema over the first. What is an epizema? Over the first note of sumus. Epizema means you lengthen. So you lengthen the note. Sumus. Without the epizema, it would just be sumus. Do you see how um, not only is there an epizema, but there are a lot of notes on, on sumus. And then moose only gets mu. So it's interesting. The So they do. Why do they do that that way? Is it just because it sounds nice? Because it elevates the proper emphasis, the proper syllable that is to be emphasized. Um, so the they're emphasizing it according to the pronunciation of the word. Exactly, to the pronunciation of the word. Exactly. Um, same thing on... Et resurrectio nostra. Nostra is nostra. Nostra. So it emphasizes and gives you the most notes on the the syllable, which is to be stressed. So why is that important? Because it's respective. It, it respects the text. If I did nostra, you would not catch what that word is. Right. right? Okay. But if I do nostra, you get it. Right. Okay. So it's emphasizing the right things at the right times. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, it, and it really it comes from cantillation of the Psalms. So the Jews in the temple would kind of sing, speak the Psalms, but they would always be according to speech patterns. Now, I've never actually heard it done, so I don't know what it would sound like, but it's not singing as much as we were in chances, but it's not sing- speaking either. What do I need to take away from today? Um, take away... From it, the three the three qualities that are proper to sacred music, that it must be holy, it must be true art, and it must, and if you have those two things, it will be universal. Okay, also take away that the purpose of the liturgy is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful. Okay, and finally, that the music which best accomplishes these ends the music which is tied to the liturgy with the music, the only form, the only music that has grown up within the church, only within the context of the church is Gregorian chant and polyphony. Secondly. And then the, and for next week, what do people have to look, have to look forward to? We're going to talk more about active participation, what that means. And we're going to talk about, um, again, just more of what, of what, 
60 years after Trilis Lecitudini, what the church was saying about sacred music. And so for next week, the, um, what I want to do is start with some questions from you guys. So I know a lot of people have a lot of questions regarding sacred music and music during mass and things to that sort. And so if uh, you have any questions, comments, or concerns, email me at FonsecaProductions at gmail.com. Fonseca is spelled F-O-N-S-E-C-A in productions. FonsecaProductions at gmail.com. And I will filter the questions to Max so he can prepare for the uh, for our uh, podcast next week. One last thing. You were talking about uh, the use of Latin in the liturgy. Right. And, and the active participation. Okay. To go back to St. Therese of Lisieux. So she's living... 1873 to 1897. Um, there's a part in the story of a soul where she talks about the feasts, how she loved going to mass on the big feasts. And she didn't know Latin, but she knew through the, the catech, she says, because her sister Pauline taught her so well about what was going on in the mass, she knew exactly what was happening. So she received cate- outside catechesis and, um, she's also, they also read, you know, she says, Dom Guéranger's The Liturgical Year. And Guéranger was the, kind of one of the founders of the liturgical movement that I was talking about that sought to emphasize that the people, that the Mass not be changed, but that the people's disposition towards it uh, be improved. So she says that they would read that at night. And so you can see that um, if you just learn about the Mass outside of it, then you can appreciate the splendor of the of the sac of the uh, of the mysteries, even if you don't know every word. She says she loved when they would process around with the sacred monstrance, and she would they would throw petals at uh, rose petals at it. She says she would be she was so excited when her petals would hit the would hit the monstrance. Wow, that's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you one more question. Mm-hmm. What? How do you, how does music, especially sacred music, affect your spiritual life? How does, how do you use that in your spiritual life, like personally? I have to admit that it's, it is tough sometimes when you work as a musician. You have to really, and I'm just learning how to do this. You have to figure out how to, how to balance the two, how to not make, how to not functionalize sacred music, to not make it be just another part of your job. Um, and the way that I'm finding to do that is to pray over and consider the texts that you are uh, going to be singing. So thinking about, for example, this nos autem gloriari, we should not glory in anything but the cross of Christ. Praying over that and um, seeing again how this music reflects the text and um, letting it be, letting the chant be a prayer letting it be your prayer, rising up to God. It really, every time I, I, I lead a scola, I get a sense of completeness, of wholeness in my, my soul. I feel very much at peace. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a little hard to explain, but I know that when we've done it right, when we've, when we've really considered what we're doing, and you know, sometimes we don't always have time to, things happen, we don't have the time to pray over what's going, what we're saying. But when we do, it feels so, uh, when we've, when we've done it for the glory of God, I do get a sense of fulfillment and completion. And what about in outside of, um, of choirs? Do you ever use sacred music in your personal and private prayer life? When I'm doing the divine office, um, not so much with myself because I'm usually saying it by myself in places where I can't really sing. So, um, but when I'm saying it with my family, for example, we'll sing parts of it. We'll sing the... Uh, the hymn or the the Marian antiphon at the end, which right now is the Regina Chaley. I guess that's about it. Okay. Anything else you wanted to add? Any last notes, things uh, that interest well, you? Again, it's not really appropriate to sing Gregorian chant outside of the liturgy. Um, it's not appropriate because these texts are for the mass. They're not for private devotion, which is different from liturgy. The, the rosary is not liturgy. <laughs> I love it, but it's not. It's not the public prayer of the church. So that's why we have to separate the two. So um, 
what were you going to say? Any last thoughts? Yeah. Any last thoughts um, or anything you want to add or anything, um, any tangents or anything that not related that you wanted to talk about, but weren't, didn't fit in. I would just say that the world needs beauty. Bishop Robert Barron, who I owe a lot of my, where I am today to him. Uh, he says that in today's world, and I think he's right. He says that people, if you t- try to tell them what's, what's true, well, the truth has been challenged. It's people are relativists these days and they say, well, who are you to say that I'm, that, you know, this X, Y, Z is true. Right. Um, and it's a little bit hard to, unless you're really smart, it's hard to get through to them. They may also say, and then if you say, well, this is good or this is right, you should or shouldn't do this. They'll say, well, who are you, who are you to judge? Who are you to tell me what's right or wrong? But the third transcendental beauty is something that doesn't need explaining. So Gregorian chant, beautifully sung, people don't need to, you don't have to explain to someone why they like it, why it is pleasing to them because they know it just, it just happens. Um, So I think that the world can be saved by beauty because beauty is something that as von Balthasar says, I know we, we, we don't like him, but he's right about this. It, grabs you and then it sends you forth to go and tell people about it. You tell people about a beautiful song you heard or a beautiful piece you heard. So it's evangelistic in that way. So this is why we should be caring for the music we do in the, in the liturgy. Awesome. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much, Max. Uh, we're going to close out now and um, I tune in next week to find out more about our sacred music. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please uh, let me know. Uh, send me an email at Fonseca productions at gmail.com. I would love to have any questions, comments, or concerns. I will uh, pass it on to Max and uh, we will address your questions as the first thing we do. And uh, I think we'll start doing that if we have questions, especially regarding sacred music while we have Max here before he joins the Norbertines. And um, yeah, so we'll close off and uh, God bless. And we'll, uh, uh, Max, you want to say a Hail Mary? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst women, women and blessed is the fruit of thy, thy womb, womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Philip and James, pray Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.